Good morning, team. This is Chaplain Eric Tischer. Just wanted to send out a greeting to each of you from San Antonio, where I'm currently stationed. Uh, hoping to get up there early summer right now. Planning to be up there second week of June. Of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic and the stop movement orders, that could change. But we'll, we'll be flexible. We'll work with that as best as we can. Look forward to meeting each of you and do want to thank you for all you're doing there at Hill Air Force Base, all you're doing for the airmen there, all you're doing for the civilians and the families. And uh, particularly during this pandemic, it's important that you be visible uh, and that you be there for people to make sure that their spiritual resilience stays high and to make sure that they feel uh, a sense of hope through this difficult time. I do thank Chaplain Cho for uh, polling you folks and uh, asking you a few questions on uh, that you may want to ask of me. So uh, at this time, I'd like to address some of those. First question, I've got another computer to my left if I keep looking over here. What books or influences have impacted the way you lead? That's a great question. I gotta let you know, I, I read a lot. I've read a lot of books. I've read a lot of leadership books. And so uh, that, was, that was kind of a hard question because there are, there are so many good books out there. Uh, Solomon was correct in the book of Ecclesiastes when he said that the writing of books, there is no end. And uh, having written one myself, if you've ever written a book, it feels like there's no end to the book you read, uh, the book you write rather. But first of all, I do want to start out, uh, and this is probably a little bit predictable, uh, the Bible. And this is the copy that my wife gave me last year on our anniversary. It has my favorite verse etched on the cover. Uh, that's Philippians 1.6. It, it smells and is made of, uh, of bison hide. So I really like that Bible. But the Bible is influential to me as a leader. Um, there are many great leaders in the Bible. There are many lousy leaders in the Bible. And so I get great inspiration from both. As far as military ministry goes, I think we have a great paradigm in the person of Daniel in the Bible. Uh, Daniel and his uh, three partners, uh, Mishael, Ezreal, and uh, Hananiah. You know, we always remember the names they were given, but it's trickier to remember their given names. Uh, but those four friends uh, were at a time when the the King, uh, the people of Israel were in exile. Uh, Daniel worked specifically for four different heathen rulers. Uh, these were rulers who were not God-fearers, so it was a little bit different, but Daniel was able to uh, maintain influence, and, and he did so, first of all, uh, their, the influence of these four friends, and we have to remember they were a team, first of all, was communal because uh, they worked together. Uh, secondly, it was attractional, and that is uh, the, the fact that they were different, the fact that they brought something different to the table got attention for them. And then it was also relational, and that is that it connected what was different to what was professed. And so as uh, ambassadors of the one true God, they were able to connect the reason they were different to the person of God. And so we find great inspiration from him uh, and a great paradigm for what military ministry should look like. A second book here, uh, Henry Nowen's uh, The Wounded Healer. Uh, Henry Nowen uh, was a, a Catholic monk, and uh, he specifically wrote on the need for the person giving the ministry to understand their own woundedness, and out of that woundedness to be able to heal other people. Uh, John Piper, personal favorite author of mine, uh, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. Uh, that is written specifically to pastors, but I think it applies to uh, chaplains. It applies to religious affairs airmen. It applies to anyone doing military ministry. Uh, the, basically, the premise of that is we're not too good, we're not too high to do that which needs to be done. And so I try to read that book every now and then as a reminder. Now, shifting to sheer, to regular leadership books, Robert Greenleaf, Servant Leadership. Uh, I first discovered this book when I had written, read rather, several leadership books that quoted Greenleaf. So if you keep seeing a certain author quoted in books that you're reading over and over again, at some point the light bulb clicks on and tells you you should read that book. And so that's what I did. So I highly recommend Robert 
Greenleaf's servant leadership. Uh, Peter Singe, the fifth discipline. This is specifically about team leadership. And uh, the fifth discipline basically being the learning organization. And uh, when one looks at organizational leadership, ultimately the goal of leading an organization is to help the organization lead. I discovered this when I was doing my Doctor of Ministry studies. Uh, it's really an excellent book. Third category of books. First, I dealt with the, the kind of the spiritual formation books. And I dealt with the uh, traditional leadership books. The third is more of a... Um, more I put in the other category, developing the person to be the leader. Uh, first of all is emotional intelligence. If you haven't read this book or don't understand the concept of emotional intelligence, basically what it says is uh, IQ doesn't do everything. It's about understanding who you are and, and, and why things cause you to react certain ways. Uh, really a very important book, and it's one of those that I go back to often. And then the final book, this, this is a sociology book, okay? But I do have a bachelor's in sociology, so there it is. Uh, it's it's uh, written by Everett Rogers, who was a rural sociologist. It's called Diffusion of Innovations. Uh, he is the father of, of what's called the social diffusion theory. And uh, that is the theory, by the way, that underlies the Green Dot curriculum that until recently the Air Force used. Uh, it's a, it was actually also the theoretical framework I used for my Doctor of Ministry thesis. And basically the I, idea of, of the social diffusion theory is there are influencers and they're able to influence others quicker than non-influencers can. And it, it goes into much more depth than that. But where, where this is important as a leader is it helps me to understand my audience, helps me to understand those I'm leading, and where they're at in the, in the adoption of innovation and what I can do to help them to a, adopt quicker. But overall, as a leader, just to describe myself as a leader, I believe in working hard. I believe in working smart. I believe in uh, propelling people and bringing people along. Uh, going back to the Bible, uh, many times within the scriptures, the Lord refers to himself as a shepherd. And a shepherd's goal is to produce uh, meat, it's to produce dairy, it's to produce wool, and it's to produce more sheep. And so ultimately, it comes into production. And so as a leader, I need to help my people to produce. So those are some influences I've had as a leader. Second question here, what are your expectations regarding the balance of unit engagement and chapel-based activities for your chaplains and religious affairs airmen? Okay, there's another great question. Uh, as far as uh, as far as you know, I've heard this my whole career. Which is more important? And the answer really is yes. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we are there to make the military ministry happen, so the units can't be neglected. On the other hand, according to Title Ten and according to the First Amendment, we are there to provide for the free exercise of religion. So we cannot con disconnect religion from the things uh, we do. We have to we have to strike a balance, and ultimately. Uh, we, we need everybody involved in both. We can't do a division of labor where you go over here and take care of the units while I go over here and take care of the chapel. I, I don't believe that we should have a division of labor. Uh, number one, uh, we really need to keep our thumb in both uh, as individuals. But then secondly, when the, the unit ministry becomes too disconnected from the chapel or the chapel becomes too disconnected from the unit, the other doesn't benefit from the one. Uh, the, you lose synergy there when, when they're divided. So the reality is my expectation is, is uh, as first chapels, chaplains rather, uh, you know, we recently got this guidance memorandum from the chief of chaplains, and I'm going to read what it says here. Uh, it says, each chaplain, when practicable, hold a re appropriate religious services at least once on each Sunday for the command to which the chaplain is assigned and perform appropriate religious burial services for members of the armed forces who die in that command. Uh, what that tells me is we need to be involved in the chapel. Now, for the Protestant chaplains, uh, you know, Hill does have a Protestant service. That, that's, that's easy. I would expect somehow that they would be involved in uh, the Protestant parish. Uh, for, for others, I understand Chaplain Larson's LDS. I understand we don't have an LDS program on base. 
Uh, when I get there, I'd like uh, for us to be able to sit down and, and figure out what that looks like for you. Uh, but it's, it's important as chaplains that, that we are practitioners of religion. We're sent there uh, because our endorsers, my endorser, by the way, uh, North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, or NAM, as we call it. And NAM sends me into the military as a religious practitioner. And so I think their expectation is that I'm going to be involved in leading uh, in a worship or a religious setting on a weekly basis. Um, and so it's, that's important that we do that. Uh, here in my current job, I'm in a staff job. So, of course, we don't lead services on the weekend. However, I've been involved in a local church. But also, I've been teaching a Bible study on Lackland Air Force Base weekly for almost two years. And so that's, that's how I've been able to uh, put that into practice. Now, for religious affairs airmen, of course, there is no religious requirement for you, but your spirituality is still important as well. And so my expectation for you would be that you're able to uh, feed uh, the spiritual domain in you. And so uh, when I get there, I'm, I'd like to sit down and meet one-on-one -on -one with each of the team members. And uh, particularly for the religious affairs airmen, I want to hear from you what I can do to help you stay spiritually fit. So that that is a, a very important aspect of who we are. Now with that, and I'm going to caveat this, and this might make most people cringe, uh, I tend to be a little stingy when it comes to CTOs. I've seen too many situations where chaplains will preach one hour uh, a sermon that, that they've preached five or six times before and expect an entire eight-hour day off. Well, uh, for chaplains, again, I believe that practicing a religion is part of your job description, so you shouldn't get time off just for practicing your your religion. However, we'll, we'll figure it out together. We'll figure out what that looks like uh, together. I'm also not a clock watcher. Uh, the Air Force doesn't pay us by the hour. They pay us salary, which means they pay us for product. And so uh, I've been on teams where uh, CTOs cut into the product uh, so badly that the mission wasn't getting done. So we have to be cautious of that. At the same token, not being a clock watcher, if people are sitting around and there's not much going on, I don't have a hard time letting people go for the day, even if it's not 4.30. Uh, but the expectation there is when I need you there, I need you there, and that you're going to work hard and, and you're going to work smart, and uh, you're not going to uh, complain if, if I need you there till 5, for example, or later. Uh, we've all been in those situations. But again, back to the original question, my expectation is, yes, chapel involvement, but also unit involvement. Third question here. How do you plan to engage with the Protestant chapel community? Well, I, my wife Shannon, by the way, uh, you'll get to meet her. Uh, we're going to hit 25 years of marriage here in June. Hopefully we'll be there in time for our anniversary. Uh, the stop movement may delay that, but we'll have an anniversary nonetheless. Uh, we intend to make the Protestant parish our primary weekend worship experience. We also plan to be involved in religious uh, education. Uh, we, we both like to teach. We like to teach individually. We like to teach as a, as a team. We believe it's our calling. So we would like to be able to teach there at uh, Hill Air Force Base there at the Legacy Chapel. Uh, so uh, that is our intention. As a, as a preacher, I don't need to preach every Sunday. That's probably a relief to Chapel Lawson, but uh, I do expect to preach once a quarter. So that's how I plan to be involved there. And then as, as we get in there, We'll figure it out. You know, until I'm boots on ground, it's, it's kind of hard to exactly tell. Uh, but as far as parish involvement, I do also intend to attend the Catholic uh, activities and worship services often enough that they know who I am. I'm not, of course, I'm not Catholic. I'm not going to step in and try to stick my spoon in their chili. But at the same time, they need to know who I am. I'll be the, the wing chaplain on base. They should know who I am. They should feel like I'm their chaplain as well. So those were the questions you gave me. Uh, there were no, no personal questions, but I'm going to share with you a little bit who I, who I am. Uh, as I already mentioned to you, I've been married to Shannon for almost 25 years. Shannon is a native of Salt Lake City, Utah, so this is a homecoming for us. Uh, we were married on June 16th, 1995, there in Salt Lake. at It was called Holiday Baptist Church now. I think it's called Canyons 
church in Salt Lake. That's where we were married. So uh, I also lived in Ogden, Utah for a while. I was doing temporary work as a campus minister there at Weber State University. Uh, that was back in, in 1994. So I'm familiar with the area as well. Uh, we've been back there many, many times. Uh, Shannon still has almost all of her family within an hour of Hill Air Force Base. So she's very excited about us coming back there. Uh, together we have uh, four children. Uh, there's Cayenne. She's 24. She's a, a full-time baker. She lives in Illinois right near Scott Air Force Base. Uh, I was stationed there two assignments ago, and when we left, she stayed. So uh, she's there. There's Caleb. He is, a, he is working on his master's degree in history at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green. And then there's Micah. Micah lives with us, and Micah is a full-time barista for Starbucks. His intent is to stay here. However, because of the pandemic, his two roommates now have a lot of financial anxiety, and so his two potential roommates, rather. And so he may be making the move with us. We're going to see. So you might get to meet Micah. Micah might make, he's 21, so he can do whatever he wants, but he may be making the move with us as well. And then our youngest is Kara. She's 19. She is finishing up her sophomore year at Scarborough College. Scarborough College is the undergraduate school of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's in Fort Worth. And so she's finishing up her sophomore year there. And so uh, those are our children. Um, no grandchildren yet. No pets currently. We want to get a dog when we get there. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Shannon homeschooled our four children. She's, she was a stay-at-home mom, still is a stay-at-home wife. Uh, got some health issues. Uh, so um, in my free time, I tend to stay pretty close to home. So I spend time with her. As far as my hobbies, uh, woodworking, camping, hiking, uh, anything automotive, those are my hobbies. Favorite movies, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That's, that's, you'll learn more about me. Uh, but that's enough for now. I want to learn more about you. I look forward to, again, meeting each of you face to face. Uh, I pray that uh, God makes this odd pandemic time of ministry a time of growth, a time of innovation, uh, and, and a time of blessing for each and every one of you. Again, Thank you for your time and God's blessing to each of you.